I'm glad I'm in the monitor. It's pretty pretty good. Hey, I'm glad you're here today, and uh, I want to welcome you to Fluellen. I look around and mostly home folks and guests. And uh, man, I, I'll tell you, I went across the way during the offering time. I just went across the way. And the kids are getting it this morning. They are having worship and a message. And uh, so it's happening here. It's happening over there. And uh, it's happening in homes, too. I've got several people that have, that have connected and said, hey, we're, we're going to be connecting at home. And so I know that people are connecting at home, too. You know, when you're part of something like the Lord's Church, it's bigger than just one location and one moment in time. You know, the Holy Spirit... He, uh, he draws us together, and it's bigger than that. How many of you, the rain kind of gets you down a little bit? The, the weather kind of, it, it gets you a little down. Okay, all right. Thank you for being honest. How many of you, the cold and the snow and the ice being stuck in, that, that kind of wears on you? Anybody? All right. You know, uh, the battleground for the Christian is our emotions a lot of times, you know, our feelings, you know. And that's where in that soul part of man, you got the spirit that's the, the deepest part of a person. That's where God dwells in a believer. And then you got our body that just takes in all the stuff around us, the news, the, the weather, whatever it is, you know, all our circumstances. And then you got that middle ground, that, those feelings, those emotions, those thoughts we struggle with. And so David is going to be real raw here today in his emotions, all right? This is the, the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist, the one who is in touch with God. But he's going to be really real and raw. If you have your Bible, I hope you'll open it to Psalm 22, and we're going to look at a couple of verses here, and uh, three psalms that go right in a row that talk about who God is in the nature of Jesus. I want to kind of give you a visual real quick to talk about this idea of our emotions, okay? Big Mike, can you help me? Come on up here. Come on up here. And Big Mike is going to be the, uh, the Christian in, in the situation, okay? And uh, so I'm going to use Big Mike. You all have seen trust falls before, right? Do you know what a trust fall is? Okay. Have you done one before? Okay. So we're going to do it. Come, come over here where we've got plenty of room, all right? We're going to do a trust fall, all right? And so I want, I'm going to go over to my normal side over here. You, you turn and look at me this way, okay? Now, uh, I, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to have a trust fall, all right? And I want you to um, just trust me. I trust you. You trust me? I trust you. Okay, all right. So close your eyes because, you know, tr uh, you, you look at me for a minute. You, you know the Christian life, you can't see everything. It's blind, right? You're going blind. So in the Christian life, all right, I want you to trust me. Close your eyes, and I want you to, I want you to just... Put your arms out, okay, and I want you to trust fall. Just lean back and trust me, all right? Can you trust me? Backwards, don't forwards because I'm, all right? So trust me, fall. Okay, I'm here, I'm here, all right? Now, here's the Christian life, though. Now, sometimes you expect, close your eyes, sometimes you expect God to be somewhere, and he says, trust me, right? And put your arms out. Now, I want you to do it again. I want you to fall back. I noticed that foot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you weren't entirely sure, were you? Uh, Terry's going off stage. So let's try it again. Let's see. All right, close your eyes. And uh, let's, let's, see, let's see how good you are, all right? Because this is tough, all right? Arms out, not forward, but backward, all right? Trust me. Okay, good. Everybody give Big Mike a hand. <laughs> I trust you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Everybody give the Holy Spirit the hand. The, Terry. He did a good job. Now, sometimes we, we have our expectations of what God will do or when He will come through. And when we hear His voice and it's not that particular place where we assumed or that way we assumed, then we begin to panic. And we all do what Big Mike did. We, we, we give ourselves that extra out, right? I mean, that's just natural. That's just natural. And, uh, you know, then we learn. And I tried to, you know, say, all right, Terry's going to, you know, and I tried to, you know, say, hey, you know what, let's do it again. But see, he had some wisdom now. Hey, it's going to be okay. He's not going to let me fall. And sometimes trust in the Lord is like that. We learn. We learn 
little bits and we learn little bits. And sometimes we, we do, we bail out at the last minute. David here is being real, real with his emotions. Let's look at Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. And you're going to hear a tone to this. It's going to remind you of something here in, in verses 1 and 2 when he says this, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some translations say forsaken me. Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night, and I have no rest. Not a show of hands. Just think about it. Have you ever felt distant and forsaken? Has your pillow ever been wet with tears? Have you cried out, it, it, at the moon, at the stars, God, where are you at? Have you beat the steering wheel at night and when you arrived home or before you left? Like, God, where are you in this? But no answer. No rest, David said. I, th I think this is very real and raw. I love that the Psalms are just a picture of true human emotion. But David, in the middle of this, he pauses in reverence to say, God, I know you're holy. You are enthroned in the praises of Israel. The translation records it this way, inhabited in the praises of your people. That God inhabits the praises of us when we praise Him, that God is there in the midst. And so He says, I know who you are, but our ancestors have trusted you. They trusted you and you rescued them. They cried to you and they were set free. Like, God, I, I know that you have done it before. I believe you can. You've done it for others. Will you do it for me? He's still reverent, but it's possible to be confused and frustrated and hurt and in despair, but also know God is God. Then he reminds the Lord, hey, I was given over to you at birth. Well, I love baby dedications. We're going to have one very soon here at church. and It's an awesome time, but it's really a dedication of the family. You have been my God from my mother's womb. In other words, my parents taught me who you were, and I've known you ever since before I was born. Don't be far from me. Distress is near and really, no one else is here to help. Is there anything worse than feeling distant and separated from God? Some have defined hell as separation from God. Not to negate the fire or the worm or some of the other things that the Bible talks about, this hell, that, that, the second death and hell, but separation from God. David continues about what this suffering feels like. Many bulls surround me. The idea of a bull is that it, would, that it would pound its prey by blunt force. They open their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. He feels bitten and wounded, maybe by their words. I am poured out like water. All my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax and melting within me dislocated bones, torn, people literally tearing at his flesh. He's bruised by blunt force. He's wounded. This, this poetic story here, he's talking about himself. Is anybody getting a picture of another person who went through some of this? Who prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who has dealt blunt force trauma, who's, who's, who suffered people literally ripping at his flesh, who's Bones were dislocated, whose heart melted within him. As, we, as he continues, he says, My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. He's thirsty. You've put me to the dust of death. I am lower than low. Dogs have surrounded me. He's like a, a gang of coyotes or wolves circling. A gang of evildoers closed in on me. They pierced my hands, and my feet. Interesting, this is what he's feeling, but nowhere in history can you find really an application of this verse. This, this phrase right here, they pierced my hands and my feet, is purely prophetic. David doesn't understand that Jesus is going to be crucified someday, but he's saying this, and all of this is going to happen to Jesus on the cross, and yet... He says this here, they pierced my hands and my feet. 
Just pure prophecy. So you feel David's pain, but you also see Jesus on the cross in this. I count all my bones. His flesh has been ripped from him. David's not literally, but figuratively he's feeling all this. People look and stare at me. He feels exposed. He feels shame. He says, they're treating me like I'm already dead. They divided my garments among themselves. They cast lots for my clothes. David feels like they're already dividing up my inheritance. Splitting up his belongings like he's already dead. And of course, this literally happened to Jesus at the foot of the cross when the soldiers are, are dividing up his things and casting lots for his clothes. But you, Lord, don't be far from me. My strength, come quickly to me. He's not praying to his own strength. He's praying to the Lord and he's saying, Lord, you're my strength. Come quickly to help me. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of wild oxen. He's praying here, one of the shortest prayers. I think the shortest prayer in the Bible is in Psalm 12 where it's simply two words, help Lord. But here's two that are great. Save me. Save me. Sometimes it's not the long, beautiful, prepared, flowery prayers that we might like to hear somebody pray. It's just the heartfelt groan. God, we need it. And right in the middle of this, that's not even the whole verse, because right in the middle of this verse, he interrupts and says, you answered me. Isn't God good to do that? Isn't God good to know when to step in and answer? You answered me. Oh, I'm going to proclaim your name. Not just his name, but his nature and who he is and his character. That God is good. I'm going to tell everybody, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to praise you in the assembly, in church. When I go to church, people are going to know it. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. You descendants of Israel, revere him. What he's telling you is God's people, honor him, praise him, revere him. And let's talk about him. Because God is good. He answered me. Well, if you've ever been in a situation where you needed the Lord. Lord, it's the last moment. Lord, look what they're doing to me. Lord, I'm broken. Lord, I'm wounded. Lord, I'm hurting. I can't do it anymore. And the Lord says, trust me. And you don't know whether you can trust him or not. Oh, you can trust me. And then at the last moment, seemingly almost past. Now, Here's one of the greatest verses in the psalm, Psalm 22, 24. For he, God, has not despised or abhorred the torment of the oppressed. He did not hide his face from him, but listened when he cried to him for help. He did not leave David. David felt alone. What was the first phrase? My God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken or abandoned me. And what he's saying here is he realizes, I was not forsaken or abandoned by God. Have you ever heard a preacher, Brother Mark, you probably have heard of preachers, and they, around Easter, uh, you know, maybe Good Friday or maybe on, on Palm Sunday, they'll make a big display of this moment where all sin was laid on Jesus and the world grew dark and the earth shook. And God the Father in heaven, this is what they'll say, God the Father in heaven, could not look upon sin and turned his face away. And so Jesus prayed, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever heard something like that before? Here's what the scripture says, is that the father never looked away. He did not hide his face from Jesus. He did not abandon. Jesus was not forsaken. David was not forsaken. You're not forsaken. And here's the struggle between our emotions, our feelings, and what is true. Because we can feel forsaken because of our circumstance. We can feel abandoned because of the things we've been involved in, our trials, our temptations, our sins, our weakness. We feel those things because we're human. But that doesn't make it reality. God does not hide His face. He doesn't grow distant. Oh, He hears us when we cry. And so this is a psalm about the past, a past of what God has done through Jesus. And I love what John said. He said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus says this in John. 
The good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. See, David wrote it in a time of despair, but it was prophetic about Jesus because the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But then Hebrews goes further, and Hebrews says this, our Lord Jesus, he's the great shepherd of the sheep. Because he didn't stay dead, he rose from the dead. He didn't just give his life, he came back to life, and he ever lives to make intercession. And so because Jesus is living, he's not just the good shepherd, but now the great shepherd for the sheep. And so then you get into Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And there's something better than having the good shepherd or the great shepherd, and that's to have my shepherd. That's when it's personal. The Lord is my shepherd, and David says, what, I have what I need. I shall not want. Anybody, when you were a kid and you heard the King James Version, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did that ever confuse you? Like, the Lord is my shepherd, I don't want him. The Lord, I shall not want. I read that and I was like, why wouldn't we want the Lord as our shepherd? No, the Lord is my shepherd. And so, because he's my shepherd, I have no wants. Sheep have needs. And it, it's human to desire. I read this this week. To be human is to desire, to need, to desire more of things, more of pleasure. But if the sheep has the shepherd, the sheep really lacks nothing because every need is met in him. When he is your shepherd, you realize you have everything you need. I realize that God gives me so much more than I need, though, doesn't he? And so David continues. Even when I go through the the valley of the shadow of death, if you've heard it that way, the darkest valley, I will fear no danger. No evil is going to come upon me. I have nothing to fear because you are with me. I might face some things in this. I might grieve. I might have some things. But I don't have to be overcome with fear because you are with me. I'm not separate anymore. I'm protected. Your rod and your staff, they bring me comfort. Only goodness and God's covenant love, his faithful love, that love that he's promised, that unconditional love, will pursue me all the days of my life. And so today we have the opportunity to literally pause and stop the message. We're going to sing a song. We're just going to contemplate this. Stop and think about that. As they would write this psalm, as they would write this song, they would get to that word and they would just pause. And there would be silence in the church, in the temple or the tabernacle, and they would just ponder the King of glory coming to earth. The King of glory, not in His return like the rapture or the end times, No, his return now, like, is he returning in my life? Is he returning through my life in this earth? Has my head opened up its gates? Has my eyes and ears, the ancient doors, have they received the king of glory? He's a worthy king. He's a powerful king. He is a true king. I'm going to ask the praise team to come forward. We're going to sing in just a minute. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of the ages. He's he's the king of everything. The king of kings. He's the king and the Lord of armies. The scripture says he's the king of glory. He's worthy. Is he your king? Your shepherd and your king. Stop and let's think about it. Heavenly Father, help us to ponder who you are, what you've done. Based on the sacrifice and the offering that you gave of yourself. Based on your living to care for us and shepherd us. To protect us and pursue us. And based on your return, may we open our hearts and minds to follow you, to worship you. You truly are great and mighty and worthy. Let's sing of your greatness.
church, would you join me in singing this? You can stand. And let's praise the Lord again.